Genesis chapter 3, being introduced, learning about the old devil. He's a mean rascal, amen? Appreciate Sandy's weekly bombardments. This guy, she gives me an article about extraterrestrial. This guy said he successfully used the name of Jesus Christ as a way to stop his abduction experiences. I believe that. Now, I don't know for a fact that people are actually going up in ships. I do know for a fact that people believe that these things have imparted things into their mind. And they don't have an explanation for it. But that's the way the devil works. So, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than... Any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, yea, hath God said. You shall not eat of every uh, tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely Die. He's directly contradicting what God had said. That's his weapon that he uses. Get people to not believe all parts of the Bible. Or to believe little bits here, but you don't have to believe everything it says. Contradicting God's word. And then he adds to God's word by saying in verse 5, For God doth know. That in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the devil's plan to try to elevate man up to the level of the gods. Okay, And man's falling for it everywhere. And it doesn't matter whether... It's in the, like the first church of Satan, or you belong to a witch's coven, or you go to a UFO conference, or you're practicing, you're dabbling in a little bit of what's called white magic. It doesn't matter what form it comes in. In fact, the devil doesn't require belief in the devil to follow the devil. Whereas God requires belief in him and in his word as part of salvation. So we're introduced to Satan in Genesis chapter 3. And the Bible then is sort of giving us an idea of who he is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You pray for me this afternoon. Father in heaven, we come before you today. And God, we just thank you for the love that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the visitors that have come our way. Lord, we've enjoyed fellowshipping with them. Pray, dear God, Lord, that you would allow them to travel safely back wherever they are from. And Father, it's been a joy hearing their testimony and how you have blessed them through this church. And Father, we ask God that you would allow us to continue to be a blessing to them, all the people, Lord, that they make contact with, all the people that are watching with us online. We pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would just visit with them and be kind to them. Father, we know the devil is, and his devils are around us every day. We know, God, that they hinder us. They try to stop your work. They try to cause division among your people. They are the, he is the accuser of the brethren. And Father, we know all these things from your word. And, we, and Father, it's your word and your word alone that we trust. No other source. So Father, we pray, God, that you would enlighten us, open our eyes tonight, help us to see great and mighty things that we know not. 
Bless us as we give forth your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All the God's people said, uh, Ezekiel 28, just touch on a few things there. We covered some of this last uh, Sunday afternoon, really, four o'clock is afternoon. We haven't rolled our clock while we fall backward. We haven't rolled our clocks back yet, so the sun's still out. But very quickly, Ezekiel 28 gives us a description, I believe, of Satan. He calls him first the prince of Tyrus, king of Tyrus, and then the prince of Tyrus. So we know now what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a principality. He is the chief of all the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in high places. He is, the, he is the head over all of the devils. And so Ezekiel 28 verse 12 says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, saying to him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx. The jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. Think about walking into a jewelry store and seeing all these displayed in there. They put lights right over the top of all these precious diamonds and emeralds and gold. They want you to see the beauty, the radiance of it. And that's Lucifer. That's who he was. He was adorned with all, the, and it was built into him. That's that was his substance, it was all these diamonds and barrels and precious stones and gold. And then the Bible says, The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So we know that he had musical instruments built into him, into his very being. He could play the saxophone, the harp, the piano, the, the drums. He could play the guitar could play everything. He knows music. And I believe he uses it. Don't you? Absolutely. There's a difference between watching a movie with no music in it. And then watching that same movie with that background music in it. They know how to pull those emotions. The music goes along with the scenery of the film. So we know that he had all those. He was beautiful in the day that he was created. But then... In verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. And by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled, thee, uh, filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. So now we see his downfall. We don't know exactly when this took place. Sometime between day four and Genesis chapter three, day four of creation, Genesis chapter three, which wasn't all that much time. It doesn't seem like a lot of time has transpired in between those two events. So immediately after being created and given his position, he is cast out from it. Did God know that Satan was going to act this way? He's God. He had to know. So it was no surprise to him. So he created him for that purpose. And then verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. And oh, listen, I drive by churches and I see these beautiful buildings. And I covet that. Oh, that would be nice to have that church. That's a sin. I just committed a sin. Broke the commandment. I'm to be happy with the church that I have. The humble little brick-faced cedar ceiling church i'm to be happy with the few that come that are faithful rather than the masses that don't want to hear the truth that run from it 
But that's that's Satan. That's his crowd. That's he. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And I will cast thee to the ground and lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Now, Revelation 12. Let's turn there. Revelation 12. War going on in heaven. I have a theory, if you want to hear it, do you? Yes. How come only the visitors say yes? Okay. All right. Do what? <laughs> yeah, Roy would have said no just to say no. Now I forgot where I was going with it. Now I have a theory. Yeah, Revelation 12. Let's, we'll get there. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. In Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost. Peter's preaching out of the Bible. Imagine that. Out of Joel chapter 2, and he's standing up and he's quoting um, verse 19 of Acts chapter 2. I will show wonders in heaven above. Now people sort of speculate about what those wonders are going to be. Maybe the planets are going to line up. Or maybe the moon's going to do something weird. Or maybe UFOs are going to come crashing down or whatever. But I think the wonders, if the Bible says there's wonders in heaven and then... You're in Revelation 12, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. I think this is related to that. I think it has to be. Because there's two of them here. Two great wonders. The first one is the woman, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She being with child, cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. And then there appeared another wonder in heaven. Now we have two wonders. Behold a great red dragon. So I think that qualifies I think on the day that Pentecost happens for the second time, I think this is going to be manifested. Okay? Could be wrong. But I, rather than trying to guess at what these wonders might be, I like the fact that the Bible says it in plain terms. This is a wonder in heaven. And maybe, maybe they're connected. So maybe we have a sure word of prophecy here. So in verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. We know who this is. It's Lucifer. Lucifer has seven heads. Now what would that be like to have seven heads? You, with seven brothers, and they all have a mind about where they want the body to go. They all have a mind about what they want to do. Seven heads, it's like working for four bosses or seven bosses. Okay? So wherever you work, pretend you had, Todd, pretend you had seven bosses. Huh? Please no? And they all had, all gave you different instructions. Okay? See, to me, that's a kingdom divided against itself. It's weird, but that's who it is. Uh, in verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and they cast them to the earth. This event, I think, is paramount. I think it's absolutely the biggest event to ever happen on the earth. A third of every star in the heavens cast down to the earth. Don't be fooled by anybody. Don't be deceived by anybody. This earth and the people in this earth is the absolute exact center of everything that God is doing. He's not got some other plan with people on another planet that he's also working with. It's us. And it's all about us. 
His son, God's son, died for us. It's about what happens here. The stars that the devil takes with his tail and, and captures them, he doesn't throw them on a planet somewhere else in some other star. He casts them down to the earth. That tells me that the earth is the center of, every, of everything that's important. It's, it's about planet earth. The very last battle to be fought is going to be fought right here on this earth. Very last one. And then there's not going to be any more. So he did cast them, drew the third part of the stars of heaven, did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour a child as soon as it was born. Now the child, I have a couple ideas. The child, number one, is Christ. I believe that. His first and second coming, both of them. Because we know the devil tried to kill Jesus after he's born. He tried to kill the Savior when Moses was born. And he tried to kill the Savior when Jesus was born. And he missed both times. His aim, Sterling, is way off. Okay? Huh? Like yours. So he kills everybody else except the one that he has to kill, that he needs to kill. Which tells you something about his nature. He cares nothing about humanity and human blood. It means nothing to him. Human beings mean nothing to devils. They would kill you in a moment if they were given leave to do so. You mean nothing to them. Whereas for us, I mean, we're Christians try to follow God and stay away from sin to just go out randomly shooting people. That's not in our mind. We don't think about, except for on really bad days. Okay, but we just don't think that way. But the devil, it's because we care about fellow humans. If somebody, if you were at Walmart and somebody over there got shot, you were standing next to them, you would do something to try to save their life. You would intervene. In it. That's natural affection. Devils don't care about people. They're murderers. Every one of them. And so is the devil. And he's ready to devour this child as soon as he's born. So we know he tried it in Moses' time. We know he tried it in Jesus' time. And we see it here. And I want you to think about what she's giving birth to. She's giving birth to the Son of God. The Word of God. Okay? So he devours or seeks to devour and destroy Christ. Kill him. Get rid of him. Because Satan knows that Christ can defeat him. So you kill him. Okay? This brother over here was a cop. In Joyzy. Lots of mafia stories he's got to tell. And I'm sure he knows stories of a mafia boss sending out a hit on somebody saying, we got to kill this guy. Right? Maybe. He ain't saying. He ain't saying. The devil says, I got to kill Jesus. I got to devour him as soon as he's born. But notice that as soon as he's born, he's caught up. Do you know that's the same word in 1 Thessalonians 4? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. Same word in English and I believe in Greek. Arpazo. The Latin word is raptura. Rapture. It means caught up. It's what it means. Okay? So... We know that he, Jesus rules with a rod of iron, but we also know because Jesus told this to the seven churches, he said, if you, if you, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but he said, if you keep going, keep doing what you're doing, you will rule with a rod of iron. The church. So we know that we're going to come back with Jesus to rule with him for 1,000 years. And Satan is going to be under our feet Amen. for 1,000 years. Amen. I love it. Now look at verse 7. And there was war in heaven. 
Can you imagine that? A war in heaven. Um, turn to Psalm 82. Psalm 82. This is God looking at the lesser gods, the assembly of angels, both good and bad. Psalm 82, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty and he judgeth among the gods. See, all these, all these good angels, two thirds of the angels are good. One third of the angels are bad, but God rules every one of them. None of them do anything outside of God's permission. None of them do. So that's maybe foreign to what you've heard or maybe how you thought about things that devils are disobedient to God and they're evil and they don't do what God says. But if you look in scripture, clearly God restrains them or he allows them. They go at his command. The story of Ahab and how Ahab called Jehoshaphat up and he said, why don't you go to war with me? Jehoshaphat said, I, boy, I don't know. I want to hear from God on this. So Ahab said, well, I've got 400 prophets. I pay them well. So they'll prophesy. And they prophesied and they said, go up, go up to battle. You're going to win. You're going to get the victory. And so Jehoshaphat said, he's not, he doesn't feel right about what they're saying. Because he knows that Ahab's paid him to say all this. And so Jehoshaphat says, I want to hear from God. Don't you have anybody else? Well, there's this one guy, Micaiah. But I don't like him because he don't tell me what I want to hear. Sounds typical, does it not? So Mike, they bring Micaiah along. Micaiah says, I saw God. And I saw the assembly of angels. I'm paraphrasing all this. But God said, who will go and deceive Ahab? One spirit said one thing. One spirit said another thing. Finally, the spirit said, I'll do it. And God said, wherewith? How? I will go and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets unto Ahab. God said, go do it. And that's given you, that's given you a picture of how the world really works. Politics. And things that go on in politics around the world don't just happen at random. They happen at purpose. And there's usually spirits behind politicians. Who believes that? Devils! Amen. Um, politicians, leaders, kings, queens, you name it. There's, an, there's a devil. There's spirits working through them. Religions. All religions have spirits, have spirit forces. Evil religions have evil spirits that are with them, that control those people, that mess with their head, that lie to them, that deceive them. We, as God's children, have protection around us. We have angels that stand guard over us. That was shown to Gehazi, Elisha's servant. And I believe that. And I believe that there are angels that minister to us every day. Who in here has ever been in a situation where you were almost going to get killed and all of a sudden, boom, you're not dead? Look at that. Truck driver, cop, I bet. You had angels intervening in your life. I, we're alive because God used those angels. Okay? So we have in Psalm 82, we have the assembly of angels. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. And then God says this. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? See law. Think about that. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. And remember, evil angels don't care two cents about people in this world they care nothing about humans god made us lower than the angels so he said in verse five they know not neither will they understand they walk on in darkness all the foundations of the earth are out of course and then verse six 
this is what where it gets interesting. So I'm going to bring my gray alien out here. Okay? I've said you're gods. All the angels are gods, little g, because they are immortal. They do not die. But there are exceptions. I've said you're gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall at Roswell like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. So God, there's a war in heaven right now. War in heaven right now. Michael is fighting the devil. Some people ask me, Pastor, do you believe that's past or present or future? And I say, yes. Yes, it is. Thank you for bringing that up. Because heaven doesn't really have time the way we have time, I don't believe. So anyway, there's a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. The great dragon was cast out. So now there's going to come a time when Satan is going to be cast out from the presence of God. He's not going to be able to stand next to God and accuse us ever again. God's going to say, I'm sick of it. I'm throwing you out. So we have a picture of that in the Bible. Canaan. Canaan. The land that God promised to Abraham is a foreshadowing of heaven. And there are people living in it. But God hates them. Because they're evil. They're giants. They're evil. They worship Ashtaroth. They kill their children. They practice witchcraft. God hates them. So God is going to cast them out. And all their cities are going to be empty. And the Jews are going to move right. And that's exactly what they did. The Jews cross the River Jordan. They go into these cities. And nobody's living there. They don't have to build houses. They don't have to build. So they just move in. Where all these people used to live. They take over their barns. They take over their houses. Their shops. They take over everything. The Jews are still doing that as far as I'm concerned. Okay? So, Satan's going to get cast out. Him and a third of the angels falling down to heaven. That event, I promise you, is going to be significant. I promise you, it is going to be noticed by every man, woman, and child on the earth at that time. Because you're going to look up and you're going to, oh, I see stars falling. A third of them. So, verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So now the Bible is identifying, which deceiveth the whole world. So underline that in your Bible. He deceives the whole world. The Vatican is deceived. Mecca, people at Mecca are deceived. People in Washington, D.C. are deceived. People who live in San Francisco are deceived. People who live in St. Louis are deceived. People all over the world are deceived. Every false religion is a religion of Satan because that's who they ultimately worship as their God. And that's what he wants. He deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. That event is not going to go unnoticed. I promise you. Okay, big, that's going to be a big deal. So then, when Christ comes back in Revelation 19, the battle of Armageddon takes place. Revelation chapter 20, we're going to start the thousand year reign of Christ. And to initiate that, at the very beginning of it, in Revelation 20 verse 2, he, an angel comes down, he laid hold on the dragon... That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And then in verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And there's going to be, and I don't know why God's doing this. But after the thousand year reign, Satan's going to be loosed out. He's going to gather together his army again, just like in the good old days. Back, you remember back a thousand years ago when we fought against, let's try that again. 
He's going to lose. And an angel is going to grab Lucifer, Satan, the dragon, bind him and cast him into the lake of fire. And he's going to burn there for eternity. And we're going to hear him scream. I can't wait. Can't wait. My wife thought she heard that last night. She come in after going to your house and she said, is there an animal that screams like a human? And I'm just going. And she said, I'm walking in the house and I hear this scream coming from the woods and doodads going up down my back. And I said, I don't know. It was. She pulled it. She looked up online and come back to the room and played it to me. And I'm going, oh, that's freaky. It was a fox. Woo! Okay. But he's going to let him. He's going to let Satan loose. He's going to start another war. It's going to go very quickly. It's going to bind him, cast him in the lake of fire. Now, what the, the core nature of Satan is he is the tempter. The tempter. Go to, uh, we already read Genesis chapter 3. He tempts Eve, the woman. He goes after the woman. People, the devil will always go after your weakness. Male or female? Always. Whatever your weakness is. Some of you have a weakness for money. You want money. Some of you have a weakness as far as maybe lust of the eyes. Some of you have a weakness maybe lust of the flesh. Some of you have a weakness that goes along with pride or whatever it is. But he knows your weakness and he targets that weakness every single time. He's the tempter. So where Eve failed... Jesus succeeded. Turn to Matthew 4. Jesus succeeded. The Old Testament failed. New Testament, victory. Amen. Amen. That's exciting. If I was in Kenya, they'd get up and dance over that. Woo! Oh, now I'm dizzy. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, I've made mention of this. If you compare the two, Eve was surrounded by food. She was not even hungry at the time. Surrounded by food, had access to everything, not fasting. She gets tempted and fails. That's us. I can eat at a restaurant, drive by another restaurant, say, boy, that smells good, and want to go in and eat. I don't have room for it, but I want it. That's the wicked nature of our flesh. I hate the flesh. I hate it. So Jesus led up in the spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he was afterward and hungered. Oh, I bet he was. And when the tempter came, notice what it's calling him, the tempter. I spelled it wrong. He's the tempter. The one who lures you in to sin. When the tempter came to him, he said, if thou, if thou be the son of God. See, he's always questioning God, the Bible, Jesus himself. Yea, hath God said. He's questioning God's word. And here he's questioning God's word in the form of Jesus. If thou be the son of God. Now, do you think Jesus knows? Do you think Satan knows that Jesus is the son of God? Yep. That's why he went to him. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's how we live, people. The Bible is our life. That's why these two guys came here. Because they, they know they're going to get Bible verses. Am I right? We've made an impression. They know the back of your head. Right? Right? So we made an impression on them. They, 
These guys want the truth. So they know the truth is in the Word of God. And Jesus then, he gives Satan scriptures. And that way you're never wrong. But yet, uh, verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. He saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written. Now he's going he's to pull out a piece of a Bible verse. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. If you go, that's from Psalm 91. If you go to Psalm 91, you'll see right after that where we're going to trample the dragon. Okay? Why didn't he quote that part? And um, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And people, I, I just want to, I want to nail this down inside your heart. Don't tempt. God by forcing him to forgive you with your deliberate disobedience. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Yes, Satan quoted that verse. And yes, had Jesus fallen, the angels would have come and bared him up. Okay, I asked you all ago if you know for a fact that angels intervened in your life to save your life. Yes, you know it for a fact. You didn't see them, but you know it. But there was nothing in here that says if he deliberately jumped to force God into action. Nothing like that. It was a bad spirit. And this idea of once saved, always saved, where... Now that you've said you're saved, you can do whatever you want and God must forgive you. Don't tempt God that way. Don't do it. Verse 8, and again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain. It was higher than high. My belief is, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And then another, another writer of the gospel says in a moment of time. So, Todd, I believe that every kingdom from the beginning of time to the end of time, all around the world, Satan is able to show Jesus all of that. And all of those kingdoms, we know because we've read it that Satan has had his hand in those kingdoms. He's a prince, a principality. He's, he's in politics. He's the reason why the Supreme Court voted to legalize abortion. Voted to legalize sodomite marriages against the will of the people. He's the reason why the politicians are corrupt, the judges are corrupt, the presidents are corrupt. He's the reason why all of that happens. And he says, I'll give you all of these kingdoms if you'll fall down and worship me. When I was a child, I used to think, why didn't Jesus do that? He could have had all the kingdoms then. I didn't know Revelation 11, when the seventh trumpet sounds, all the angels proclaim the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. He's going to get them anyway. Binding Satan for a thousand years. And so, verse 10, then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shalt thou serve. He quotes scripture to him. People, the antidote against satanic powers is the presence of the red word of God. And I don't mean red, R-E-D. I mean R-E-A-D. Read the Bible. Meditate on the Bible. That's the antidote against the temptations of Satan. Where the Bible is present and believed and exalted alone, Satan and his kingdom cannot survive. 
They cannot prevail against you. They, Satan tried to prevail against Christ. Forty days without food, he's skinny, skin and bones, drawn up, very hungry, very weak, very frail, and yet he passed that test. Because he knew the glory that was going to wait for him on the other side of the cross. This is the beginning of his ministry. He's still got three and a half years to go, but he's waiting on it. Um, First Chronicles 21, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Satan is a provocative spirit. He provokes people to do evil. You ever gotten into a fight with your spouse and then after you made up you go what was that all about anyway you ever had that happen oh yeah the devil is a provoker he's a provocateur and you think you heard something you didn't then that's what that's not what was said you didn't hear it right I do believe the devil has the ability to confuse things Going from person A to person B. I've experienced that. I believe that. That's what he does. He, things are never straight with the devil. They're always crooked. Always crooked. Because that's how he is. He's a provocative spirit. Um, there's too much here to deal with in the book of Job concerning Satan. And how he works. So we'll get into that next Sunday night. Okay. But study Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2. You get an idea that he, his power is great, but his power is limited by the hand of God. He does, and you know, it's like, what can God do to Satan to enforce his will to tell Satan, Satan, I'm telling you, you can afflict his body, but you cannot kill him. What does God have over Satan? To put that limitation on Satan's going, I'm Satan. I'll kill him if I want to. But he doesn't. He knows he's limited. How does that even work? I think maybe it's because the devil knows God can take him in a moment and cast him into the lake of fire. You're done. You disobeyed. You broke the rules. I'm God. You're not. I think that's what it is. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's a joy to be with your people today. It's a joy to go through your word, to learn things. And Father, our enemy is great. He never stops. Never stops. Every day we wake up, he's worked on a plan while we were asleep to try to bring us down. And I hate him for that. I hate what he's done in my life to my life I hate what he's done to me I hate what he's caused me to do I hate the pain that he's afflicted on people that I care for I hate him but father I'm aware of how he works he may have done it once, but he's not going to do it again without a fight. I may not win, but I'm going to fight him. I'm going to stand against him. Because I hate him. I hate what he does. I hate what he's done in people in my family. I hate what he's done in people in this church, because I love the people of this church. I pray, dear God, that you would always strengthen us. And encourage us, help us, dear God, put a spirit in us that is just not afraid of him. And I believe, Father, that in season, in the time when it's necessary, you will not allow us to be afraid. I believe that we will be victorious and we'll be bold. So, Father, help us to learn about our enemy, learn his tactics, learn what he can do, what he cannot do, how he's restricted. Help us, dear God, with that. Give us that knowledge so we can have wisdom from that in years to come. Bless your people tonight. Bless your word. I pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.